So, here are two awkward facts about philosophy. No philosophical problems have been solved and philosophers can't agree about anything beyond that. Those facts markedly contrast philosophy with the sciences. Many scientific problems have been solved and there's appreciable agreement between scientists in scientific matters. So what's wrong with philosophy and what's wrong with philosophers? I think there are various closely related questions here that don't quite come to the same thing. So there's the question of why no philosophical problems have been solved. There's also the question of why there's been no appreciable progress in philosophy. I think those two questions differ. If there's been no progress in philosophy, then no problems have been solved, but not conversely. Um, it might be that um, there's been progress in philosophy, but it might be asymptotic, always approaching a solution, but never quite getting there. Then there's the question of why philosophers persistently disagree. That strikes me as a further question. It might be that there's progress in philosophy and that some problems get solved, but there could be still persistent disagreement. So consider the history of mathematics. I take it that uh, Cantor made tremendous advances in our understanding of infinity, despite the fact that there were benighted holdouts such as Kronecker who would have none of it. So the fact that there are people with entrenched positions who continue to disagree uh, doesn't mean there's no progress when that no problems have been solved. Um, well, having separated those questions, I'm happy really to consider all of them. So there is persistent philosophical disagreement. Why is this? Without a suitable explanation, it seems very implausible to suppose that despite this, some philosophical problems have been solved or that they're approaching solution. And again, in the absence of an alternative explanation, the fact that there is persistent philosophical disagreement seems to be evidence against the claim that there's substantive progress in philosophy. Well, to name names, two staunch proponents of this pessimistic take on philosophy are Peter Van Inwagen and Bill Lycan. Some quotes, Van Inwagen says, in metaphysics, there is no information and there are no established facts to be learned. More exactly, there is no information and there are no facts to be learned besides information of facts about what certain people think or once thought concerning various metaphysical questions. I mean, he's talking there about metaphysics, but he um, wants to generalise that to philosophy. Lycan says, in his kind of pithy style, philosophical consensus is far more the result of zeitgeist, fad, fashion and careerism and of accumulation of probative argument. And again, he says, so is there distinctively philosophical knowledge? Yes, I'm forced to agree, but only in dribs and drabs here and there, far less than gutting has maintained and nothing to write a song about. There you have it. Well, Lycan is somewhat more concessive than Van Inwagen. According to Van Inwagen, the only knowledge to be had in philosophy is who said what and for what reasons. End of story. Lycan seems to admit beyond historical knowledge the, that we've got knowledge of various positions and of how viable some of those positions are, where viable just means not obviously false. Beyond that though, Lycan doesn't think we've got any knowledge of philosophical facts. Benny Morgan remarks that, quote, it would not be the whole truth to say that by definition there is no body of philosophical fact because it's a defining characteristic of philosophy that it has no information to offer. Well, suppose that this is at least part of the truth. All the same, we might still sensibly ask why this is a defining characteristic of philosophy. So analogy, it's a defining characteristic of war that it's terrible but there are still informative things to be said about why war is terrible. Likewise, there might be other features of philosophy that explain why it has no information to offer, if indeed, as Van Wagen would have it, it has no information to offer. So we needn't be misguided in trying to find such an explanation. Um, in this paper, I'm not gonna pursue the issue of the extent of our knowledge in philosophy or to investigate whether there are any established facts in philosophy. Um, 
for the purposes of the paper, I'm happy to take on board Lycan's kind of mildly concessive view. Um, let's grant there's been progress and corresponding agreement about recognising many and various views as viable. What I'm interested in is the fact that there is this persistent philosophical disagreement, um, disagreement about the solution of any key philosophical problems, and the fact that there's markedly more disagreement in philosophy than in the sciences, the natural sciences. So I'm particularly concerned with the questions, what's the significance of these facts? How should they be explained? Um, let me say something about the issue of epistemic peers and superiors. So an epistemic peer with respect to some topic, or epistemic peers will be a pair of people who are matched with respect to their degree of understanding, the information they've got, their level of attention, their diligence. I guess it's an idealisation to say that there are any epistemic peers, what we get are more or less or near epistemic peers, people who are more or less matched in these cognitive and evidential respects. Now, for any philosophical topic, there are epistemic peers who disagree. Even more strikingly, for many, if not all, philosophical topics on which you have a view, there are epistemic superiors who disagree with you. And by an epistemic superior in philosophy, I mean someone who is a smarter philosopher than you. And by smarter philosopher than you, I mean someone with more philosophical ability than you. Van Wagen made this issue vivid in the following way. Suppose you're a compatibilist about the free will debate because you're convinced by the consequence argument. So the consequence argument roughly says, given the setup in the universe many thousands of years ago, plus the laws of nature, it is inevitable that we have the current setup and it's inevitable that you behave as you do. As a consequence of that, your actions aren't free. That roughly is the consequence argument. Suppose you're persuaded by that. Now, David Lewis is a smarter philosopher than you, and he understands the consequent argue, consequence argument at least as well as you. There's no e reasoning in the argument that you can follow that he fails to follow. There are no distinctions in the argument which he's failed to unearth. Nevertheless, for all that, Lewis rejects the argument. How should you respond should you remain as confident before about the argument or should your degree of confidence in the argument decrease somewhat or should you follow Lewis and reject the argument altogether? It seemed partial to retain your original degree of belief in the argument given the fact that Lewis rejects it. The fact that Lewis rejects it is some evidence that the argument is unsound. By the same reckoning it would be partial to suppose that you've got some insight into the argument which Lewis lacks. At one time Van Wagen entertained this view. The idea of insight was um, perhaps you could have information that's very hard to communicate but nevertheless you have it. Could you be in that position that you have insight? Well the fact that Lewis rejects the argument is evidence that you lack such insight or that if you do have this insight it's mistaken. Of course Lewis might be smart um, but still be wrong and you might not be as smart as him and you might be right but why suppose it's you rather than him who possesses insight other than the fact that you believe the consequence argument and he doesn't so if insight tracks smartness the odds are that Lewis has insight not you and if insight doesn't track smartness all bets are off as to who is right okay we might distinguish here from, I suppose, epistemic from a motivational issue. So the issue I'm discussing here is epistemic. You know, are you entitled to remain as confident in your prior belief in the consequence argument, given the information that Lewis rejects it? The motivational issue is something different. That would be, uh, should I continue doing philosophy given that there are epistemic superiors who disagree with me? Should I throw the towel in? Uh, so. I don't think you should throw the towel in. The situation might be like your aspiring partner for the World Boxing Champion. You know you're going to lose every match with this person, but nevertheless, it may be beneficial to him and it may be beneficial to you. Okay. 
And you might have other motivations, intellectual curiosity, a need for intellectual stimulation, something like that. No matter. It can be quite reasonable for you want, to want to do philosophy, even if you know that you're going to be just a, an also-ran. But that's not the issue I'm concerned with. The issue I'm concerned with is the epistemic issue, as I say, about what degree of confidence should you have given the new information that Lewis disagrees with your view. Okay, so should you follow Lewis and reject the consequence argument? I guess there are various things to say here. Let me just offer a, a few considerations. Lewis thinks the consequence argument is flawed, and he even wrote an argument about it. If Lewis were both smart and right, he'd be able to show less smart philosophers like you and me just what is wrong with the <coughs> argument. He'd be able to construct a sound counter-argument, counter explaining each step of it in careful and accessible detail, so that you and I would be able to follow his reasoning and become convinced at the end of it. But that's not what we find. I take it when we read Lewis's reply, we understand it and we come away unconvinced. So Lewis isn't both smart and right. Now he's assuredly smart, therefore there's some reason to think he's not right in rejecting the consequence argument. Here's a further consideration. I suppose it's one about other minds. Even if Lewis were the smartest <coughs> philosopher around, many other leading philosophers disagree with him. So we have philosophers like Van Wagen, Jeanette, um, David Wiggins here. I suggest that collectively these philosophers are at least as smart as Lewis with respect to this issue. <coughs> so what should you think about the consequence in the light of this? You're caught between conflicting sources of testimony, conflicting epistemic superiors. And I take it it's likely that you're going to find yourself in this predicament for pretty much every philosophical issue on which you take a stand. What should you do? Well, you might have a failure of nerve and think the lesson to draw from this is that we should become agnostics. We should be agnostic about every philosophical issue and agnostic about pretty much every philosophical argument. But that doesn't seem to me to help because if you're an agnostic, you're still going to be disagreeing with your epistemic superiors. These are the people who are telling you to believe P and you're being agnostic with a P. Ah, but doesn't the fact that they tell you that P provide evidence that you shouldn't be agnostic, but you should believe P. So agnosticism seems to be a position which faces exactly the same challenge as we've set up here. Also, the agnostic view may seem to assign too much weight to the views of others in philosophy, even if they are your epistemic superiors. It seems to overlook the evidence and the arguments that you possess and the justification they confer on your view, despite the fact that you know that some philosophers disagree. They may disagree with you, and they may be your epistemic superiors, but that doesn't license you abandoning your position any more than the fact that the ancient Greeks would have been licensed in disbelieving what their eyes told them when they faced the arguments of Zeno that matter and well, motion was impossible. So I think that philosophical testimony has some weight but it can be outweighed by what you perceive or what you argue. So those are some thoughts on that kind of conundrum, which I don't think I've really fully thought my way through. But anyway, I, I offer that. Here's a different issue that Van Wagen raises, and here I think uh, we can be tougher still. So he raises an issue about the contingency with which each of us forms our philosophical beliefs. Um, and this is going to be an issue that applies to epistemic peers and superiors in philosophy alike. Van Wagen supposes that he's perhaps reached equilibrium between his philosophical theories and his data. But it strikes him that his data could so easily have been different. So let me quote the passage from him. He says, The point of the philosophical equilibrium I occupy depends perhaps on predispositions to belief inherent in my genes, very likely on what my parents taught me about morals and politics and religion when I was a child, and certainly on what university I selected for graduate study in philosophy, who my departmental colleagues have been, the books and essays I've read and haven't read, 
the conversations I've had at an APA divisional meetings as a result of turning right rather than left when I wandered through the reception. Other philosophers have reached different points of philosophical equilibrium simply because these factors have operated differently in the course of the formation of their opinions. These reflections suggest, and the suggestion is very strong indeed, that I ought to withdraw from the point of philosophical equilibrium I occupy and become a sceptic about the answers to all or almost all philosophical questions. Well, I agree with Danny Wilkins reflections, but I disagree with the conclusions he draws. I mean, one opening point, I think you you'll be ahead of me in seeing this already. The kind of considerations he mentions don't apply just to philosophical views, but pretty much to all of our views. You know, it's a, it's a sobering thought that um, the circumstances in which we form most of our beliefs are highly contingent. If you'd have been born in Saudi Arabia or North Korea or an Amish community, you'd have had very different views about politics and culture and history and science. So the considerations he mentions don't single out philosophy specifically. Secondly, let's turn to the issue of philosophy. I guess here is with me, and this is probably how it is with you. On the basis of the evidence available to me, and assuming that I'm at least moderately rational, I've formed certain philosophical views. Um, I've realised that many other philosophers have different views on the basis of different evidence. I don't know what their different evidence is. I haven't been privy to um, their experiences or chance meetings or reflections. And if I did have the evidence I, that they have, perhaps I wouldn't hold the beliefs I do with the degree of belief that I do. Perhaps I'd have revised some of my beliefs. What am I to do? Well... I think the rational thing for me to do is to form my beliefs on the evidence I have and be prepared to update my beliefs on that basis. Um, if I ran into these philosophers and fell into conversation with them, I might acquire reasons for the different beliefs they have. But ex hypothesis, I've already formed my beliefs on the basis of the evidence I have. Um, where the evidence includes the fact that... Um, I'm aware that other people have formed different beliefs on the basis of different evidence. Um, being a rational person, I'll seek out further evidence. I'll be prepared to update my beliefs when new evidence comes in. It seems to me with all that in place, there's nothing else for the rational person to do. And there seems to be no special problem concerning my philosophical beliefs. So, um, although Van Wagen's, um reflections are sobering and salutary, I think there's quite a, a humdrum response which we're entitled to make to them. I guess what he's put his finger on is an issue about the nature and distribution of epistemic luck. For our purposes, the key point is the following. Certain kinds of epistemic luck undermine our putative knowledge and thereby undermine our beliefs, but certain others don't. So, for example, um, it's luck that you exist it's luck that you've got the capacity to form certain beliefs. But I take that luck doesn't undermine your knowledge that you exist or that there's a table in front of you. The considerations Van Wagen offers apply to all of our beliefs indiscriminately. Um, and as I've pointed out, if his belief were successful, um, it would ramify and affect all of our beliefs without any discrimination. And all of our beliefs would be undermined. That strikes me as proving too much. And for all that Van Wilden has said, it's an open question which side of the kind of undermined, not undermined division philosophical beliefs fall on. In particular, as far as his, as his reflections go, it seems to be an open question whether in the circumstances philosophical beliefs would, without exception, fall on the undermined side of the distinction. It seems to me plausible but if we can't provide a reasonable epistemology for claims about some field, then any beliefs we have about that field are undermined. So if a reasonable epistemology of our philosophical beliefs was impossible, if there could be no reasonable account of how our philosophical beliefs are reliable, then granted those beliefs would be undermined. But 
that kind of contention goes beyond the datum given to us by Van Wagen, the datum that is highly contingent that we form the beliefs that we have in philosophy. So I see um, no argument there for undermining our philosophical beliefs. Lastly, let me, let me say, there does seem to be something to the idea that it's not reasonable to maintain a given belief once you think there's no reason to suppose that whatever the evidence you have supports that belief. But as I see it, that's not the case that Van Wilkins presented. He's outlined counterfactual situations in which you'd have different philosophical beliefs on the basis of having different evidence or different training. The fact that in different circumstances you'd have had different evidence and so form different beliefs doesn't seem to me to indicate that um, you lack reason to believe what you do, uh, that your actual beliefs are not supported by evidence. So for those reasons I'm less convinced by his second argument than the one that appeals to Lewis and epistemic superiors. So that aside, let me address three accounts that have been given of why there isn't appreciable progress in philosophy. Um, these are by Russell, McBride and McGinn. Starting with Russell, in 1918 he gave his lectures on logical atomisms and he closed with the following declaration, quote, I believe that the only difference between science and philosophy is that science is what you more or less know and philosophy is what you do not know. Philosophy is that part of science which is at present people choose to have opinions about but which they have no knowledge about. And you find similar claims actually with uh, William James and more recently David Chalmers. Um, I think Russell is uh, pithy as usual but kind of cursory what he's saying. First of all it strikes me there are scientific issues that scientists clearly have opinions about but not knowledge. So in Russell's day they were concerned with the nature of matter, today they're concerned and they speculate about um, dark matter and uh, dark energy. So it seems to me that um, speculation isn't the prerogative of philosophers, so you can't make the science philosophy split in those terms. Secondly, Russell presents philosophy as having a stock of problems that over time are taken off its hands and solved by science. Quote, Every advance in knowledge robs philosophy of some of the problems which formerly it had and a number of problems which had belonged to philosophy will cease to belong to philosophy and will belong to science. That's Russell. Well, far from explaining the lack of progress in philosophy, this seems to me to entail that there is progress in philosophy. What happens is that there's a, a set of philosophical problems and they get solved not by the philosophers, but the, by the scientists. So what still remains on Russell's view is the question is, why is it that philosophers don't solve philosophical problems? And Russell hasn't addressed that at all. It seems to me that despite how many problems have swapped over from philosophy to science over the centuries, there remains this core, or a notable number, that remain resolutely philosophical and unsolved. And Russell doesn't touch the question of why is that so? Why is there this persistent body of standouts? So much for Russell. Uh, Fraser McBride has offered an account of why there isn't appreciable progress in philosophy. Let me give you the key quote in a passage. He says, what makes these problems so resilient is the fact that they are general and pluriform. We cannot expect to receive a definitive resolution until the epistemic end of days. To solve a philosophical problem requires understanding many things, but we cannot acquire such pervasive understanding without relying upon our grasp of other concepts that may also turn out to be problematic and drawing upon the results of other disciplines. And we don't know in advance what other questions will be thrown up by future developments within these disciplines or by the efforts of philosophers to integrate them into a unified scheme. But this isn't a scandal to philosophy, it's a consequence of the encompassing and compounding character of the problems with which philosophy deals that their resolution requires of us a synoptic understanding. That's McBride. Um, 
so to, to use a word I don't like to bandy around it much, he thinks of the, the source of this persistent disagreement as being the holistic nature of philosophy, as he puts it, requiring a synoptic understanding. Um, well, two comments on uh, McBride's view. First of all, he emphasises the need for philosophical inquiries to achieve overall coherence. But as Duhem showed us, that's a general feature of inquiry and not a special feature of philosophy. So we know that Duhem taught us that in advancing a hypothesis, an inquirer has a background of accepted hypotheses and has to rely then upon a series of concepts figuring in these hypotheses. To quote Fraser McBride, concepts that may also turn out to be problematic and that draw upon the results of other disciplines. Since we can't predict future developments in an inquiry or how its results are best integrated in a simple and comprehensive fashion, we shouldn't expect a definitive resolution of any line of inquiry until the epistemic end of days. So I don't see that phrase as identified a special feature of philosophy here, an a fortiori that is identified a feature that explains the appreciable lack of progress in philosophy as opposed to science. Secondly, it seems to me that there can be uh, a lack of appreciable progress in philosophy, even in cases where the feature he highlights, the one about the synoptic understanding, um, isn't markedly present, or the lack of it. So, you know, examples are going to be disputable, but for concreteness, take uh, Rowe's evidential argument from evil against the existence of God. My sense of this debate as an outsider is that the different parties markedly disagree about whether evil is evidence against there being a god. Um, but the locus of the debate is relatively confined. It's about whether, as I say, the presence of evil is good evidence against the existence of God, whether we're really in a position to make judgments about this, and even if we are, whether there are any kind of underminers or defeaters. Parties to this debate do use notions that are problematic, notions such as gratuitous evil, morality, reason, evidence, truth, probability, and each of these notions raises a host of issues. But my sense is that the parties to this debate seem largely to agree in their understanding of these notions. Uh, it's not that um, the different parties get sidetracked and start debating the right way to understand the notion of evidence or the nature of probability. That doesn't seem to me to be what happens. They seem to acquiesce or have some shared understanding of these notions and they work on that basis. Um, so it seems to me that the locus of the debate is relatively confined, but that's kept the debate going since 1979 when Roe first published on it. So the point is that the persistence of philosophical di disagreement, as we've got in the case about the evidential problem of evil, doesn't have to trace back to McBride's claim that to get a solution for any one philosophical problem, you need something like a simultaneous solution for a whole raft of philosophical problems. So that's what I want to say about McBride. Finally, um, I want to look at an account that appeals to the notion of cognitive closure. So a type of mind is defined as cognitively closed with respect to a property F, if and only if the concept forming capacity of a mind of this type can't understand F. This account thinks that there's going to be no end to philosophical disagreement, and the reason is that it is our minds are cognitively closed to the solution to philosophical problems. That's to say, we lack the cognitive capacity to solve philosophical problems and to establish true and illuminating theories. Um, I, I take the uh, kind of key idea about cognitive closure to be have introduced by Chomsky about 40 years ago. Uh, but Chomsky is quite wary about which problems he thinks we're cognitively closed with respect to. Um, but philosophers such as McGinn and Wiener Wagen are much more upfront. Uh, so McGinn says, our minds are not cognitively tuned to these problems. He's talking about the problems of philosophy. This is, as it were, just a piece of bad luck on our part, analogous to the lack of a language module in the brain of a dog. 
and Fanny Wilkin says, our cognitive capacities, although they're very well fitted to the task of figuring out cell division and how rainbows work, are not at all fitted to the task of figuring out consciousness and free will. Scientific questions are just those general theoretical questions that we are cognitively properly fitted out to answer. And philosophical questions are just those we are not. So some of the issues that arise with Russell's account are going to recur here. This account needs to explain why we're good at answering scientific questions on the whole, but not philosophical ones. Well, McGinn's answer is that we're good at using concepts which involve spatial thinking, and those are the concepts he says we use in science, whereas we're not good at using concepts which don't involve spatial fee thinking, and those are the ones we use in philosophy. Well, that can't be right. Immediate reaction, what about mathematics? We're reasonably good at doing mathematics. Uh, doesn't seem to involve concepts to do with space. Uh, McGinn acknowledges the point, and uh, he says that mathematical thinking involves what he calls thinking about quasi-spatial dimensions. That's to say, such thinking can be formally represented as being about a space. But it strikes me that by the same reckoning, we could say that philosophy involves quasi-spatial thinking, because we can say that the entailment and probability relations between propositions impose an ordering on them, and you can represent that as a quasi-spatial lattice. Here's what McGinn says about modes of thought that he thinks we do excel at. Such a mode concerns, quote, an array of primitive elements which is subject to specified principles of combination, which generate determinate relations between complexes of those elements. That's McGinn. Well, it strikes me that characterization is satisfied by propositions. They're subject to specified principles of combination. So we've got principles to do with, say, the logical constants. And then there's the uh, principle specified by Kripke in his model theory for modal discourse. They're going to determine uh, relations between complexes, where these complexes are formed from propositions. And these relations include ones of I don't know, logical independence, entailment, and so forth. So it seems to me, for those reasons, this supposed contrast between mathematics and philosophy collapses. Um, also, I think that appeals to evolution don't provide the explanation that the proponents of cognitive closure need. Suppose it's claimed that humans are comparatively poor at philosophy because evolution didn't equip us with minds that were up to the task. Here's Van Inwagen, who seems to follow that particular line. He says, perhaps human metaphysicians work by taking human intellectual capacities designed for purposes quite unrelated to questions about ultimate reality and pushing these capacities to the limit. I take the implication to be that they try this, but uh, the capacities aren't up to the job. But then I guess it's going to be puzzling why our species struggles with metaphysics, but excels at mathematics. And if it's claimed that our mathematical abilities are fortuitous offshoot of how the human brain evolved under evolutionary pressures, then I think an explanation will be needed of why this doesn't carry over to the case of philosophy. McGinn himself thinks that this byproduct story is much too sanguine. He says, quote, first, we should be a good deal more surprised by the byproduct story than we tend to be, regard it as far more puzzling than is customary. It really is quite astonishing and not at all predictable that a faculty with the biological function of reason should be capable of the feats of which it's capable. Thus, McGinn. Well, it strikes me as um, that what's puzzling and surprising isn't specifically the idea that we've got this ability to do philosophy and that it's an evolutionary byproduct. I think what's surprising and puzzling is the byproduct story itself, uh, the view that our higher cognitive abilities and our culture are just a spin off from the cognitive powers that we evolved just as a matter of natural selection. Either the byproduct story is credible or it's not. If it's credible and if it can account for, say, our mathematical ability, I don't see why it can't account for our ability to do metaphysics, such as it is. If, on the other hand, the byproduct story isn't credible, then not only is there a question of how it is that human beings have the ability to do philosophy, but there's also going to be the broader question of why it is that we have higher cognitive powers at all, these cognitive powers that we don't need for the purposes of survival. 
So either way, then, there seems to me to be no special puzzle about how human beings can do philosophy, despite their evolutionary heritage. Um, McGinn presses the byproduct story a bit more. He says, if we take the byproduct idea seriously, we should be prepared to encounter limitations that derive from the primary purpose of the organ, what he wants to call the organ of reason, as we would be for any other biological organ. The inner nature of reason, as determined by its basic functions, must to some degree constrain the kinds of side effects it can have. Well, again, I want to concede McGinn's premise that our reasoning powers have biologically imposed limits. But that's only half of the byproduct story. The story says that we can't tell from the primary function of the organ of reason, namely aiding our species survival, what else it can do. And that passage from McGinn is an entirely open matter. So I don't see that the passage raises a specific challenge for our capacity to do philosophy, again, as opposed to our general capacity to perform these higher cognitive tasks. Granted, no species can be good at everything. Each species has got a relatively fixed biological nature which confers on it certain skills, although that same nature precludes it from having certain other skills. Humdrum example, the structure of the cat's eye makes the cat good at seeing in the dark, not so good at seeing things close up. The case for human beings being cognitively close with respect to certain matters is sometimes made by an analogy then. So McGinn says, What's closed to the mind of a rat may be open to the mind of a monkey, and what's open to us may be closed to the monkey. Um, if human beings form a species alongside rats and monkeys, our minds too should be expected to have cognitive limits. Well, no doubt they do. And the question is, where do these limits lie? Not only do the rat and the monkey have limits, but one of their limits is that they are relatively unaware that they have such limits. So the rat and the monkey can't learn a language, but they're also unaware of the fact that they can't learn a language. If humans can't solve philosophical problems, how is it that they can recognise this? Well, perhaps that's pressing the wrong analogy. Perhaps a better analogy would be between children and adults. So a nine-year-old child can't understand <coughs> things which the adult can, but the child can still recognise that fact. So by symmetry, Mightn't there be things that the adult can't understand, but which the adult can recognise that they can't understand? A quote from Nagel. Um, People with a permanent age of nine cannot come to understand Maxwell's equations or the general theory of relativity or Gödel's theorem. That's true enough, but um, then these people don't understand any of the theories in these fields. Okay. Any of the theories that have received serious consideration, but have turned out to be false, so Cartesian mechanics or Newtonian mechanics or Hilbert's program. So it's striking then that human beings are adept at understanding and criticising a wealth of philosophical theories. Um. The puzzle facing those who appeal to cognitive closure is to explain why we're unable to solve philosophical problems, despite the fact that as a species we're inveterate philosophers. I mean, that might just be an unfortunate fact about where the gap lies between our aspirations and our cognitive abilities. But I took it that the appeal to cognitive closure was supposed to be more than a provocative speculation, but something like an explanatory empirical hypothesis. And unless it can explain this consequence, this um, purported fact about where our minds become cognitive closed, it's going to fail its own standard. Here's a further fact that needs explaining. Take those many philosophical theories which it's granted we do understand. Then the question is, although we understand them, why is there persistent philosophical disagreement about them, about their truth values? According to the proponent of cognitive closure, none of, these solution, none of these theories provide the solution to a philosophical problem because our minds are just closed to the solutions. So those theories, if we understand them, can't be providing the solution. Okay. Those theories have got to be inadequate to the task. Well, that tells us that none of these theories provide a solution, but it doesn't tell us why we can't agree about those theories. For that matter, why is there disagreement about the truth value of the hypothesis that our minds are cognitively closed 
with respect to the solutions of philosophical problems. That's a hypothesis that we understand, otherwise we wouldn't be debating it, yet opinions remain stubbornly divided about it. So even if the cognitive closure hypothesis explains why we haven't solved any philosophical problems, something I've questioned, it doesn't explain why there's persistent disagreement. OK, so those are my criticisms of some attempts that have been made. Uh, <coughs> let me offer, uh, throw out a diagnosis of what's gone wrong, some kind of positive hunches of my own. What we've got is a bona fide philosophical problem. It's something that can be stated in a rough form easily enough. It's not a straightforward empirical matter, and it repeatedly resists solution. Um, my diagnosis is that the fault doesn't lie with the kind of questions we ask, that they're somehow defective, say the, the logical positivist claim, or with our minds that they're ill-suited or, Ill, um, or too limited. I think the diagnosis I'll offer is to do with the methods and the ambitions involved in philosophy. So let's begin with our methods. The methods we use in philosophy are both too weak and too strong. They're too weak because unlike mathematics, philosophy doesn't for the most part provide formal deductions of truths. That's partly because there's a widespread use in philosophy of non-deductive methods. But even where deductive arguments are used, issues arise about the clarity or the justification of the premises used in the arguments. And no deductive argument will settle any of those issues. It will simply push the problem back by introducing new premises subject to the same issues. The methods used in philosophy are also too strong. I think that the same methods used to reach a conclusion from a premise can be turned back and applied to those premises and to the inferential steps used in deriving the conclusion. So then debate about the conclusion is just parlayed back into debate about a premise or an inferential step. Um, to debate means to argue, and any argument provided is going to be open to the same scrutiny. Does the answer then lie in devising some brave new method that will replace or supplement our existing methods? Well, can't rule out the possibility of methodological innovation. But even so, I wouldn't hold out the prospect for it making a breakthrough in our philosophical fortunes. The kind of considerations I've noted about our current methods would, I think, carry over to any new method that we introduce. So any issues um, about the method's justification, its reliability, its standing with respect to methods we've already got, all that would be up for debate and uh, need to be resolved. And on the face of it, there's no reason to think that these issues would be any more tractable in the case of a new method than uh, they are in the case of the methods we've already got. I keep banging on about argument. Some philosophers think this emphasis on argument is misplaced. Uh, here's a quote from David Chalmers just a couple of years ago. He reports, Burton Drebin once memorably said to me, great philosophers don't argue. A part of Drebin's thought, as I understand it, was that since arguments are so easily rebutted, giving arguments is a sign of weakness. It's better to simply assert and develop a thesis. Then one's readers, won't, then one's readers have to engage with the thesis itself without the cheap distraction of rebutting arguments for the thesis. That's Chalmers. Well, as a piece of advice, that rather sounds like saying... Um, since our attention is so easily distracted, paying attention to traffic is a sign of weakness. It's better simply to step out into traffic and cross the road. Then one can engage with the business of getting across the road without the cheap distraction of looking at which way the cars are coming from. Well, uh, against Dreb and I say, since theses are so easily rejected, it's better to present arguments for your theses. Strawson, Galen Strawson, I should say, presents something, he shares something of Drebin's attitude. In the uh, introduction to one of his books, he says, it's often said that argument is the heart of philosophy, and especially of analytic philosophy. But I'm sure that's not true. If argument is thought of as primarily a matter of formally array premises and conclusions, all arguments have premises after all, and not all premises can be argued for on pain of never getting started. Uh, well, it seems to me that Strawson is presenting an argument there, and that argument fails. 
For consider, definition is the heart of dictionary compiling, but all definitions of our words, and not all words can be defined on pain of never getting started. You can see the parallel with his argument. But um, if argument is paramount in philosophy, why doesn't the arguing ever come to an end? Um, in philosophy, our claims outrun our evidence in two respects. First, even where we agree about the evidence, it's not apparent which claim the evidence provides the most support for. Where the evidence is rich in philosophy, it tends to be disparate and conflicting, and thereby hard to assess. And where the evidence is meagre, it provides little support for one philosophical claim over another. Second, in philosophy, we often don't agree about the evidence. New evidence is coming in just because new arguments are always being devised. And, and I guess uh, in debating the new arguments, we're debating about whether they are evidence or not, and how much evidence they provide. And in the case of data beside arguments, things like intuitions or phenomenology or parsimony considerations, I guess there's uh, issues about um, whether they are evidence, whether they're fundamental, and uh, how much support they provide. So it's a bit like a fractal then, I guess, with every inferential step and every appeal to evidence and philosophy debate and argument can arise. OK, but why doesn't this problem about disagreement arise in other disciplines, ones which do use inference and evidence. I mean, it's not a peculiar feature of philosophy that we use inference and evidence. So this takes us, I think, to the other component I mentioned, the ambitions of philosophical inquiry. Um, so I think um, what's partly to blame then is philosophy's high ambitions. It seeks to identify the most fundamental level of epistemic justification for claims, and it aspires to an especially high degree of clarity and understanding. Disciplines that lack philosophy's ambitions make life easier for themselves and consequently can be more successful. Uh, they can more readily achieve consensus about the evidential status of certain classes of claims, uh, their relative weighting vis-a-vis -vis each other, and the specification of their content. Moreover, they select from only a small menu of theoretical options and disregard the wider issue of the underdetermination of theory by data. Now, of course, uh, researchers in other fields may have criteria for selecting certain theories from an infinite set of options that are consistent with the data. But then I think those researchers simply acquiesce in the appropriateness of those criteria. Much less of this framework of consensus obtains in philosophy. So where proponents of one particular view will agree on a body of data and theory, we'll, we'll find that proponents of a rival view will not share all that data, all that theory. So since so much is up for debate in philosophy, even within a given field, we find that philosophy has made a rod for its own back because its aspirations outrun its methods. One final thing before I close. To some ears, what I've said may sound old fashioned. It may sound like it's harking back to um, uh, a conception of philosophy as first philosophy, something over and above the sciences and set apart from them. Um, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think what I say is actually consistent with what uh, people uh, style as contemporary naturalism. Um, just what naturalism is. I think um, kind of shifts from philosopher to philosopher. But if I quote the master, Quine, what he says, I think, is in line with what I say. So Quine says, the naturalistic philosopher begins his reasoning within the inherited world theory as a going concern. He tentatively, tentatively believes all of it and believes also that some unidentified portions are wrong. He tries to improve, clarify and understand the system from within. He's busy sailor adrift on Neurath's boat. Well, if that's what naturalism amounts to, and I have no stakes on whether naturalism is the right way to go or not, but if that's what naturalism is, believe in the total theory of the world, um, that previous inquiry, both scientific and philosoph philosophical, has bequeathed to us, and it seems to me that there's no inconsistency between the conception of philosophy I've outlined and naturalism. So that conception doesn't place any restrictions on what philosophical claims can be revised, and on what basis, 
In fact, given that it takes philosophy to be argument without end, that's exactly one of the consequences of the conception. Okay, thanks. I'll stop there.